Okay, let's proceed with our review of exploitation technique. Last time uh, we talked about uh, printf and uh, all the shenanigans that are possible with printf. Now <clears throat> we want to give also one example of uh, the data section and BSS section. If you remember, those are data sections that contain uh, sort of like global variables, either initialized or not initialized. And this is a, a very simple example. You can see there are two, uh, the fact they are static, they ended up being in uh, this data section. So you can see here, for example, there is uh, um, uh, something that sets the file name to an argument, something that checks you know, the actual file name, and then there is a buffer overflow here. And this buffer overflow can actually overflow uh, not this in, not on the stack, but in the BSS. So this file name can point to whatever you want. And so if you're able to overflow this pointer with a pointer to a piece of you know, your buffer, then in that buffer you can put a different file. So a file that would not pass this check, okay? It could be a file that you know you want to open because that after we open, we write it and we push it out. So this is a classic example of how you can exploit buffer overflows in places that are not on the stack and uh, that are not uh, um, that are not classic in that way. Another interesting thing is heap overflow. So you guys have. Uh, for sure use dynamic allocation of memory in some assignment, malloc, free, and all that stuff. Um, you can also use new and delete in object-oriented uh, uh, languages like you know, C++. And in general, you, know, you can have the same type of situation with functions that allocate memory and return to you uh, a chunk of memory that you have to free yourself. So if you remember, while the heap grows down, the, 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 while the stack sorry, goes down, the heap grows up or down, depending if you're talking to Lucas or not. Um, but the important thing is that the memory that you create on the heap survives the execution of the function that, um, uh, that created the chunk of memory. So frames on the stack disappear, heap is allocated forever, and therefore it's your responsibility to actually take care of them. So the heap needs management, and uh, this is done through a series of memory uh, data structures that manage these chunks that are in the heap. And of course, since there are, again, control things mixed with data, you have the usual problem that we had with you know, the stack, where an overflow can touch this control structure and make certain functions um, behave uh, in a way that is not intended. Usually these attacks are architecture and OS dependent, so depending on what library is actually used to manage these chunks of memory, your attack might be of a certain kind, of a different kind, might work, might not work. And, <clears throat> and of course we will see uh, the basic one, which was Dagli malloc library, DL malloc. Uh, I think right now in Unix we use PT malloc, which is a um, sort of improvement on DL malloc that makes an, uh, a lot of different checks. But just to give you an idea of what a uh, heap overflow looks like, uh, imagine uh, this situation. You can see that here you have a username and password that are allocated dynamically through malloc, and and then two values are copied into that without with the you know infamous string copy operation so there is no boundary checking and so those variables can be um, overwritten and then you know there is an entry that is re retrieved from the password uh, if the entry doesn't exist uh, nothing if the entry is you know uh, doesn't have the password there is uh, some check checks if the password starts with um, dollar one dollar to see if there is an md5 password otherwise you know prints uh, checks the username and password and then freeze everything okay very simple program 
So the program in memory, if you look at how it's set up, it would be some, some control data, there will be some chunk of data allocated uh, for the password, some other control data, and some um, dynamic data associated, for, associated to the username. So you can see that if you say, oh, test that username Vigna has password foo, everything works correctly, and you say, okay, you know, that's wrong. And then if you say, uh, this should be test Vigna foo, a very long um, thing, you can say that it said wrong username o o o o. That means that now the password has overwritten the username and the, the program sees the username as o o o. And the moment they try to do something, you can see they will complain. They say, hey, there is some, um, some problem with the control structure of the heap because we overwritten this. And so when we try to reclaim that piece of memory, the library say, oh, something bad happened. And you know, I'll give you the backtrace. And you can see that you know, here, if you're careful, you can actually control this value and make sure that you know, there is a, a password for a root user and so forth. So this is a, an example. It's not a real exploitation. Uh, meaning we don't get to execute any code. In order to do that, we have to do uh, a little bit of uh, detailed analysis on how these chunks are actually managed. And we will see chunk management, bin management, memory allocation, the allocation, and list handling. Uh, and there is a caveat that this is an oversimplified view of the heap. The heap actually is a pretty uh, complicated management piece. Uh, for example, um, there are different treatment for small chunks uh, that usually are managed with special bins called fast bins. And then there is uh, whenever you do a chunk and you divide it in part, divide it in two parts. You use the most recent part to you know um, for the next allocation. But we're going to try to simplify a little bit. The memory layout is fundamentally uh, this. It's a linear set of chunks, okay? Some of them are used and some of them are free. So each chunk has a control part and a data part, and they're one after another, okay? And then there is a fi fi uh, final piece called the top or the wilderness, which is all the memory that is free after um, all the various chunks, okay? So when you do a malloc, you fundamentally get a chunk, uh, and then you, get a, then you get another chunk, then you free this chunk, but you know, uh, after that you allocate it, so you have some holes of free uh, in the middle, okay? The important thing is that no two free chunks can be adjacent, meaning that if I free this, well, that's a wrong example. If I free this use one, okay, suddenly, I will not just mark this as free. I will combine this with this so that there are never two free chunks next to each other. Okay? And this to avoid, of course, fragmentation, uh, which makes it you know, hard to do that. So um, each chunk, as uh, we will see exactly, has a, uh, a boundary tag, uh, which has this uh, management information. And then there is, um, and this is like two four byte um, integer. And then uh, it has optionally pointers that are used to maintain a double linked list of free uh, chunks. And the pointer that you get from malloc starts here. So, of course, since you just malloc something, these pointers are not used because they're only used for for uh, free chunks. And so when you get a malloc, you get this amount, uh, the, 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 the buffer that is returned to you points to this. Yes? Will malloc ever give you, like if you request more memory than is available in the largest chunk, will it give you two non-consecutive chunks? No. So, so it's, the, the, the allocation process is a little complex. So first of all, uh, depends on uh, what you asked, the size of it, okay? Uh, I think that up to um, 
88 bytes or something like that, or uh, th you go on the fast track. Then up to 128K, you get ch actually you get one of the chunks on the linked list, and above that, uh, they're going to do a specific memory allocation just for you. If you ask for you know, uh, half a megabyte of data, it's not probably going to be a chunk from the heap in the regular fashion, but they're going to M-map, you know, memory map a new chunk just for that. Yes? Oh, but if, if the question is whether if you do two mallocs right after each other, if they have to be adjacent in memory, then the answer is there's no guarantees that anything. It's yeah. arbitrarily adjacent. Yeah, because, uh, you know, fundamentally, the, if you do two um, uh, allocations side by side, is, you know, perfectly fine. That can be, if, if uh, the first two allocation that you made, you know, it's likely that it will be one after another. But if, if this happened after the program has been executing for a while, of course, you know, they will just see the best fit. They will find the best chunk uh, that is available for you and will give it to you. So more graphically, uh, this is a, an example. Uh, if a chunk is allocated, okay, you can see, you know, first of all, well, you have the, the, the chunk size in bytes, and this is used for user data, okay? And <clears throat> you can even use, uh, in some case, the, the, the byte of the next chunk, the, the, uh, these four bytes, because if uh, the, there is a free chunk, the previous, um, the previous chunk size is unused. If a chunk is allocated, the first four byte tell the size of the previous chunk. If a chunk is free, this is unused and can be used for uh, user data. And these two pointers are actually used to point forward and backward to the next chunk in the list. Okay? And of course, you have the size of the previous chunk in bytes because it's the next chunk. So, as I say, the previous side fill is only used when the previous chunk is free. And it tells you the, second ch the, the, the chunk above me is free and this is the size of it. And if uh, it's necessary, it can be used uh, to hold data from the previous chunk if the previous chunk is actually occupied. And, and then you have the size field that tells you uh, the, the chunk size in bytes, which is expressed as a multiple of eight to allow for better alignment of memory. Being a multiple of eight, that means that the last three bits are always zeros, okay? And therefore, the last three bits are actually used for bits. In the original DL malloc, um, two were used. One will say if the previous chunk is in use, so it's not free, then this flag is set. And the other one is if it's memory mapped, okay? But uh, the chunk size is obviously the amount of memory that you request plus the bytes needed for the overhead minus uh, the four bytes that is the previous size of the next chunk. Of course, there is nothing that guarantees that you get exactly a chunk of the size you request. You ask for some memory. And the system does its best to give you at least that memory. Could give you a little more if it's you know, the, right, um, the right amount. So you can see here that you have three chunks, A, B, and C. And for example, this in the middle is free. That means that the chunk before and after cannot be free. Because remember, there cannot be two free chunks next to each other. Otherwise, they would be put together. So let's look. In this case, we have this tells you what is the size of this chunk. Okay. So since this is free, the size of this chunk is told by the first integer in the following chunk. I know this is sometimes very confusing. Uh, and this is the size of this chunk, right? In this case, we have this size, and it says, you see, the previous one is in use, so we know that this is occupied. While in this case, the previ previous one is not in use, so we know it's free. And in this case, we have the size of this, and maybe in this case, the previous chunk was used, and um, everything else, you know, makes sense.
you can see that the chunk pointer, so the, the, what the heap thinks uh, in terms of chunks starts here, but of course what you think in terms of the chunk starts here. This is your control data that you, that you use to uh, uh, keep track of your data. When you do a malloc, even though this gets allocated to you, the pointer that is returned to you is only to this. Otherwise, you could mess, you know, with the, uh, you will have to remember that there are those first two 32-bit uh, values that you have to skip, quote unquote. Otherwise, if you start messing with this, as we will see, you can have all sorts of problems. Okay, so uh, memory is done um, keeping track in different bins. These bins fundamentally have ranges of sizes and are ordered um, by size. So, you know, this is the bin and you can see they're, you know, in decreasing size. So fundamentally, we will see this is used to find um, the right bin. These are free chunks. Okay, that during execution you fragmented memory, so these chunks are kept in a list. So that when you say, I need some memory, there is a process that will go into this. Oh, you want 1,500? I have the perfect chunk for you. Here it is the chunk. All right? So when you do memory allocation, you scan uh, the bin, okay, starting backwards. Uh, if you find exactly the correct size, you return. Um, if you don't find it, um, the most recent remainder of a split is used. A split is when there is no way to satisfy your request, so an existing bit chunk is, you know, divided. The remainder has a special place in the heap, and it will be used first. Okay, and and others, you know, bins are started increasing order uh, until you know they find something and. If they find one that is too big, they will split it so they don't uh, waste too, mem too much memory. And you have to understand that here the trade-off is between fragmentation, ha ended up with a lot of little chunks that uh, you, you don't need, and uh, speed of access in finding the chunk that is best for you. Of course, an interesting part, at least for us, is memory deallocation. So when a mem piece of memory has to be freed, the first thing you have to see is, is this next to the wilderness? So whatever is you know, unused, if that's the case, you want to make sure that it's coalesced with that. Also, if this is freed and around it there are uh, free, other free uh, chunks, you want to make sure that you coalesce them together so that you reduce fragmentation. And that's uh, this col consolidation of chunks, of course, implies you know, uh, adjusting the pointers that um, put together all the different uh, chunk. Um, and then we have to insert the new big chunk in, uh, in a bin. Interesting, there are macros to do this uh, removing of chunks from list and insert, inserting chunks in list. The most famous uh, macro is called unlink. And you can see it takes, you know, a chunk and it's forward and backward pointers. You remember that the chunk is, if it's free, you have that, um, that particular thing. And you want to, for example, remove this chunk from the list. And so what you fundamentally want to do, this is already a free piece of memory. But you, since something freed next to it, you have to take the existing free one out of the list adjust the pointers, then coalesce the one with the new one and reinsert it. So this unlink is actually to remove an already free chunk from the circular list so that you know, it, can be, uh, it can be managed. And um, you probably have done this uh, a billion times with, with, um, with list, but fundamentally you can see that this is something that goes like this, something that goes like this. So this is what we're thinking. This guy has something that goes like this, and this guy has something that goes like this, right? So this is the FD, and this is the BK. Forward pointer and backward pointer. And here, 
it's just setting initially, you know, backward and forward to the value that are stored into this. And then you say the forward, the, the thing forward pointed, um, the, 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 the chunk that is pointed forward, we want to set its backward link to the current backward. So fundamentally, you go forward and say, oh, you're now pointing at me. Well, I want you to point to my back instead and forget about me. That's what this does, okay? And then the backward forward also has to be removed and has to point to the forward. By doing this, you can see apart from fundamentally I adjusted this pointer and this pointer so that this chunk is out of the circular list. As simple as that. You've done it, you've done double link circular list, maybe not yesterday, but you know, it's nothing more than that. Also, there is a front link macro that is responsible for inserting chunks in a particular bin. The front link macro is a little more, you don't know, really is more like finding the particular bin, finding the position in the bin, going through the link until you find the right size because you want to insert these new chunks in the order by size. But fundamentally, you can see here is just the dual of this. You're just putting the chunk that you just coalesced into the right position, okay? So these are the two macro to unlink something and putting something in the uh, thing. It's not as important uh, as the unlink macro because the cool thing of the unlink macro is fundamentally this point, okay? So you can see that here you're taking something I'm pointing forward, okay, where is the back link that I'm adjusting? So this chunk will have the first eight byte, sorry, the first, yeah, the first eight bytes, the two four byte integers, and then as the front link and the back link. So 12 byte under, there is this back link that I'm adjusting to the value that is BK, which is the value here. Okay, and this is pointed by FD. So fundamentally, this particular line allows me to do uh, arbitrary overwrite anything, anywhere I want of four bytes, provided that I control the content of this, of something that has been freed and has to be unlinked. So the trick in a heap overflow is to give to the malloc to sorry, the malloc, to the um, to the library that manages the heap a chunk that you constructed you know think in terms it's like tricking uh, the the return address by modifying the ebp the frame pointer fundamentally you give a chunk and you say hey this chunk is regular unlink it like any other chunk and you say okay i'll take your forward pointer I'll go 12, do 12 dollars, 12 bytes down, and I'll set this value to your backward pointers, exactly this line. But that means that if you control BK and you control FD, which are the two pointers in this chunk, you can set any value to any value. So if a function pointer, you override it. You have GOT, you override it. You put your shell code in memory somewhere, you jump to it, okay? If you want to be super fancy, you can even have, you know, your shell code here. Of course, you have to be pretty careful because the various macros will mess with your check, with your, um, with your content. So it might not be super easy. So an exploit of this kind of a heap overflow uh, fundamentally is an exploit that causes the overflow exactly as we saw it before, but actually uh, create additional chunks. And since I see eyes glazing, we will show this the moment you come back in 10 minutes. All right, so the basic idea here is that when we overflow a chunk, okay, we're gonna create two fake chunks in the following one, okay? One that is uh, free and one 
that is allocated. So when the original chunk is freed, will be merged with the next one because it's free as well. And so unlink, oh, now, sure I'm going to get. And so um, uh, the unlink macro will be called on W to move it away. But since we control W, we're in good shape. We can do whatever we want. So this is how uh, the situation is before the overflow and after the overflow. So we have two uh, chunks that are both in use, OK? Uh, when we overflow the first, you know, we fundamentally uh, create this fake chunk W. And you can see that, you know, these, the, these first four bytes, we don't care. Fundamentally, we say that um, we have to put the right size, say that the previous one is in use, and then we have to ch create a chunk Z in addition to W, because it's in the chunk Z that I can say the previous in use is equal to zero, saying, hey, the previous size, so the previous size, this chunk, is actually free. But it's a lie. We just created that data through our overflow. Okay? This chunk, for, for in terms of you know, the, the management, nothing has changed. We just create this absolutely fake chunk, and we create also this fake chunk so that we can use this information to tell that this chunk is free. Okay? And then when free is called on the original one, x, the one that we overflown, it will go down and say, you know, free is called. So when you uh, uh, do this, I say, OK, I have to find out if this guy is actually, um, um, if the following chunk is free. So I go with size, I get here. I go with size, I go here. I check if the previous in use. Oh my god, this is actually free as well. Then I have to unlink w passing to the macro the forward and back pointer here. But all this is under our control. And so now we have that whatever we go plus 12 is going to be set to this value and also this as a side effect. But at this point we have a, a complete overwrite. So this is fundamentally how this kind of overflow is performed. There are other attacks that are carried out on the, on the, on the heap. Uh, one of the least known but uh, actually pretty interesting is a double free. So you can have a similar problem when you have something that is first allocated, then freed, and then because there is, you know, a mistake in the logic of the program, that pointer gets freed again. So in the meanwhile, if you create an allocation and you can write in that buffer whatever you want, the second free would do exactly the same that we just saw. So this is a very difficult to, to catch um, problem. You can imagine, for example, that you have some kind of, you know, multiple threads of execution, one allocates a buffer and then frees it, but you haven't thought of a certain interleave, and then the same buffer is actually freed again, and as a result, the unlinked macro is called. If you can control the content of that buffer, then you would have, once again, an arbitrary overwrite. Yes? Can you prevent that attack by zeroing out the buffer of like the end copy or something? Uh, not really, because that is not a problem of the first free. The problem is that imagine that uh, it's imagine that you have something that creates this chunk, right, and returns a pointer to the chunk, and the chunk is called you know x, and then at a certain point in the program you do free x, okay. But then there is a branch, okay, in which there is y equal malloc, okay, of some data. And because of how the heap is done, it will return you this chunk that is actually, you know, for you to use. And so here, suppose that you, you know, string n copy, you know, some data 
into this chunk and you control now this chunk of memory but there is for some weird reason at a certain point somebody will call again free x because of a specific interleave of calls and you have a double free so even if here after the first free this is all zeroed out it doesn't it doesn't help you at all because it's the next malloc that will allow you to obtain this chunk of memory in a normal way quote unquote now you have a chunk of memory you want to use it you cannot zero it because you know if you zero my memory i get really upset because i just i just need to use it for my program the problem is once you overwritten the forward and backward pointer and you create a fake chunk situation when this is called again you have a problem but what if you um overwrite memory after the first call and before or sorry before the second call that's exactly what you do you overwrite the content of the chunk between the first and the second call but if you were to zero it out immediately before the second call that still wouldn't prevent the attack well but if you zero it out this free thinks that you know this chunk is perfectly fine if you zero it you might you know ruin the content of uh, the memory the thing that the actual um, uh, the actual pt malloc does is in the unlink macro when you do all these little tricks he makes sure that this chain actually made sense so before doing anything say oh if i go forward this and i go backward do i go to the same place if I go backward here and then forward, do I go to the same place? By checking that, make sure that your forward and backward pointer actually makes sense. And so you cannot have, you know, this point to the GOT entry minus 12 because the backward pointer will not work for that. Okay. Other things um, that you can override, they're a little um, sort of exotic if you want, are uh, v tables. So these are the sort of like the function tables that are used in object to have pointer to methods. But these are data structures like any others. And so if you can overflow a v table, then you can control which code get executed because those are a bunch of fun function pointers that are stored on the heap whenever an object is allocated. So this is another possibility for heap uh, overflows. And now we're going to look at um, sort of like what historically has been done to prevent this memory corruption. We have seen uh, various types of ways to corrupt the memory. Uh, but of course, people took notice and decided, hey, we have to do something about this. Um, of course, you know, you can prevent these problems, for example, by, you know, use a language that does not allow pointer arithmetic. You know, a lot of these attacks would not be possible if you don't have pointers. You cannot do pointers plus plus. You cannot have direct control. You have just references. And therefore, you know, they're memory safe. Or uh, you can write decent programs, but that uh, has not proven that it doesn't happen. Um, or you can make certain, you know, as we will see, certain analysis before running a program in order to make exploitation at least a lot harder. Also, you can perform detection, for example, the check that was mentioned in PT malloc, where you make sure that that sequence of pointers actually makes sense before doing an unlink, is a way to uh, check. And also, if you remember, in the, uh, at the very beginning when we talk about heap, I did an overflow and the li library throw an exception. Um, you can also uh, sort of like try to determine when um, you have write and execute sequence where people try to write things in memory and then, then jump to it. Or you can you do some integrity checking, making sure that before, for example, you return from a function, you make sure that your return address has not been compromised. And people have come up with uh, a lot of different um, solutions. Not all of them have been um, incorporated in FreeBSD and Linux, mostly because it's a composition of performance, usability, and effectiveness. I mean, how, um, you know, if, if you create something that makes the, you know, uh, the operating system, you know, 30% slower, but addresses a very, very uh, tiny 
uh, threat uh, class, then people will not do it. Of course, if you do something that barely adds any performance, uh, any performance um, uh, to the system, but can rule out completely. Sorry, I'm just wiping, throwing Coca-Cola on people. But is able to completely prevent buffer overflows. Then it is a worthwhile investment. Question. Uh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do that at different levels. Uh, that, that also depends what you mean by operating system, meaning that in the kernel you can do a lot of checks. Imagine, um, in a way, every time you do a context switch, you can verify certain, you know, integrity of the system. And we'll see uh, a few examples. For example, you know, step one, non-executable stack. That's an operating system thing where you say, well, I just, if you have something on the stack, I'm not going to execute it. So people decided, hey, you know, these buffer overflows are a pain. One way to prevent it is let's make the stack non-executable. And it was great, right? So uh, we have this idea that uh, in order to avoid execution of code on the stack, use an annex uh, bit that mark the area as non-executable. So somebody say, hey, initially they had to do patches, but then they took advantage of you know, uh, the hardware. And the, you know, the most sort of general way is this idea that you will never have something that is writable and executable at the same time. It's called write XOR X. But if it fundamentally means, you know, if something you can if you can write to something, you cannot execute it. So in this case prevents you from writing your shell code somewhere and jump to it. Because if you wrote it somewhere, that thing is now non-executable. Okay? And this makes exploitation harder, of course. You know, uh, there are limitations or uh, you know, things that break when you do that. For example, if you have people there uh, jitting code, so they're doing a just-in-time compilation, they put some code on the stack and they jump to it because they use this uh, fast translation, that is a problem because you need to be able to write and then execute stuff, and so that is uh, a limitation. But um, so the problem is, uh, exactly, so uh, JIT-based things uh, will break, but one may say, hey, I'm going to take the performance hit of having a jitting uh, interpreter, and I obtain security. So, or I can make an exception only for those limited programs that need this, because, of course, you can turn on and off executable stack for a single program. It can be a, a system-wide uh, concept, and uh, but, you know, for specific case, I, you can make an exception. And so this became very popular because immediately took away all those, hey, I'm going to send a bunch of shell code and I'm going to jump to it attacks. And so people uh, start thinking about, hey, how can I really execute code if I cannot use the stack? Well, one popular thing became return into libc. So the basic idea of returning to libc is that you cannibalize functions that already exist and they're already executable, okay, by overflowing the stack and causing uh, a change in the control flow that brings you to one of the existing library. A very popular one is system. System is a function that just takes a string, invokes a shell, and executes whatever that string is. Hmm, that sounds you know, promising, of course. So it's a very good target, but uh, you can use fundamentally any string because you could use string copy and suddenly transfer things from one place to another and modify the security of the system using a string copy. So uh, system is not the only one, but of course you have to know where the code is in memory, as we will see in a second. So what is a uh, return into libc attack. It's actually a pretty cool idea. So there is a stack overflow the way we have seen before. So you have your buffer, saved EBP, saved EIP, classic stuff. But now when you overflow this, okay, 
your return address okay is actually the address of system okay then you have some fake return address you don't care about and the address of bin shell so think about it when this function returns it will do the you know move ESP EBP pop EBP and then we'll do a ret the ret will just use this we will pop this EBP that is garbage we'll do a ret and go to system but a ret is not different from a call in a way you just or a jump you just jump to system system code wakes up and say oh well I expect my parameters to be up in the stack let me go above the return address we don't care and here is oh you asked me to execute bin shell here I am I will execute a shell for you and everybody's happy okay so you can see that fundamentally a return into uh, libc is just calling a function using a ret so you return into libc and the function that gets called you know you jump to it the function is like whatever you just call me I'm just gonna you know I know you call me from this IP address which I'm gonna ignore I'm just gonna go one up and look for my parameter that you put there because you overflow this whole thing okay and by doing this you see that you don't execute anything on the stack now your stack is not exec non executable so normally you would have put your nopslad and your shellcode here but this you cannot execute anymore so now you're just using this trick to return into libc and execute bin shell or whatever command you want by invoking system so now you might ask oh yeah that's great but you know what this guy just you know uh, momentarily drop privilege can I invoke multiple function with this method of course you know you can invoke multiple functions by doing more of the same so this is your overflow now you have your garbage now you want to first execute set ID then this instead of being a garbage return address is the address of system this is the parameter of system and this is parameter of set ID so if you want to do a set to ID zero followed by system you can see that when you get this the first time you do a ret you jump to set to ID set to ID say oh yeah let's see my parameter what should set ID to oh I should go back to root great and when I'm finished oh this is my return address of the caller that you put there obviously then you return into system system is like oh I've just been called where is my parameter bin shell and suddenly you have two functions one after another okay so you can actually chain multiple function from libc using this technique by overflowing the stack who sees the problem here what is the limitation of this do you see a problem very good very good he noticed that both of these functions were very fine because they had one parameter if I had a bunch of parameters so for example if set ID has three parameter they will expect them to be here and will be interfering with the interleaving of set ID and system so the next step is going absolutely crazy and executing and uh, um, a number of arbitrary function with arbitrary parameter on returning libc how by returning after every execution into the epilog of another place in libc so that by executing the epilog with a weird set of ebp we'll adjust the stack the way we want okay and this is usually where you start losing it but bear with me for one second it's actually a pretty cool idea so the idea is that the initial overflow sets up a bunch of fake function frame so every time I, I do I jump to something and when I'm finished with the function I return into the epilogue of a function that adjusts the stack again 
and then return on the epilogue function that adjusts the stack again. So suppose that, I know this looks like a lot, but breathe it in, okay? See, this is how you start. This is your poor buffer that's gonna be abused above uh, anything that is you know, acceptable and human, and this is your saved EBP and your saved EIP. Normal thing. Now, you can see that you go a long way, and in this particular case, we want to execute a set res UID that takes three parameters, and then system that takes a parameter, okay? So, in this moment, so after we overflow, we have this whole thing, and you can see that here, the return address is actually the address of an epilogue, and the EBP is not garbage anymore. We don't care about it anymore. Actually, EBP is a pointer to fake one here. And fake one is a pointer to fake two. So I just created a link of EBP sort of like you have in a real series of frames. Now, think about what happened uh, during the execution. So here, you're finished, so you do your classic, uh, you move ESP to EBP, so I think I remove the, uh, the, the, the frame for this. I pop EBP, so now my, ES, my EBP goes to here, and, do, and now I do a RAT, but this RAT instead of going to system or to go to a set, or to go to set res UID, actually goes to the epilogue of a function. So does another ESP was gonna move here and EBP is gonna move up there. And at this point, I run set res UID, okay, for the following rat. So I do just two rats uh, the right way because now when I call this, First of all, I have my three parameters here, so set res UID is perfectly fine. And then set res UID, once has finished whatever it has to do, will do the cleanup. So if you do, if you look at here, one, this is a situation before returning from set res UID. So now we set res UID in here, and it will do ESP equal EBP. Now, set res UID will pop the EBP and go up here, and here is ESP. But now, ESP, the stack will be completely screwed, so we have to adjust it. Well, we jump into another little pop of epilogue, which will bring the ESP to EBP, okay? The EBP will go wherever they goes, and now we can run system. But you can see by doing this other epilogue, we cleared these three parameters. Okay, so instead, and I'm sure you will look at these slides and say, what did it say really? What's that? But if you think about it, every time you execute a function, then you set a fake frame, you jump just to uh, the, the epilogue of a function. So what I'm, what I'm telling you is that if this is all the code of libc, okay, this is your system lives here, res UID lives here, this is another function, printf, whatever. At the end of printf, here, there is the move ESP, EBP, uh, sorry, move EBP, ESP, uh, pop EBP, ret. So this is the epilogue. And so you use this, you could use any epilogue of the functions, you don't care which one, but use those three instructions to adjust your parameters. So you can call function with three parameters, then one parameter, and you are not constrained anymore. Okay? I think it's a great exercise. You know, really sit down with these slides and try to think, you know, in your mental assembly how this would work because it's actually uh, pretty good. Yes? It's just an example to have. So set res UID allows you to set the real, effective, and um, saved UID to any value you want. Okay. So it's just, it's just to show uh, um, sort of like, you know, a multi, useful multi-parameter function. Don't, don't, you know, it's not very important for this. <clears throat> okay. 
So this is great because now we can execute any sequence of library functions that we want and we don't have to execute anything on the stack. So at a certain point people say, wait a second, what if we actually generalize this to what we call return-oriented programming? So we don't want just to execute functions, but you remember how we execute that epilogue at the end to adjust the frame the way we want it? Well, why just do the epilogue like that? What if we do a little more than the epilogue? We execute some stuff and then we do a ret, and then we just another one and we do some time and we do a ret. So what if we could, you know, get chunks around and if they finish with a ret, we will always regain control because we will have a stack full of these return addresses that we jump to and then they will ret, that means that we're going to take another thing on the stack and jump to it, another ret, another thing on the chunk, and, and so we know where to jump. We always guaranteed that we will get control back to the address on the stack that will be popped and jumped to. So this is a technique that was introduced in 2005 by Kramer called the bar chunk, and later uh, there was a paper that actually has been uh, like, you remember I was at ACM CCS in Dallas, it has been uh, re it received uh, um, an award for one of the most impactful papers because Hovav Shakam here uh, demonstrated that you could take all this chunk and create a Turing complete language. So fundamentally you can do this chunk and compose them to execute any function. So fun fundamentally show that with enough code in libc you could run any computation just using the chunks at the end of the functions. And it created this whole, uh, uh, whole class of attacks called ROP. And right now, ROPing is considered sort of fundamentally the mandatory way of executing uh, exploit in modern operating systems because all the uh, stacks are not executable. Uh, libc has, you know, its own limitation, you don't always have system available, and so people revert to ROP in order to be able to execute whatever they want. And you can see, for example, you know, you can have something that looks like this, you know, you have a little gadget, it's a little portion of code that ends with a ret, okay? And here you can see that you would have pop ECX, pop EAX, and then a ret. Okay, and you can see that this is fundamentally popping out two values from the stack, putting in ECX. Then there is another one that say, hey, put the value of EAX into the address or organized, uh, sorry, uh, defined by ECX. You can compose these two gadgets and you have fundamentally uh, an arbitrary, arbitrary overwrite, right? So you would have, uh, in a way here, you would have the buffer overflow with the destination address and the values that you want popped and you go here and you just pop the two values you know this and where it goes and then you would have another uh, jump at address y and it will just execute the actual transfer and so by using these borrowed chunks or these little gadgets you will be able to compose them to execute whatever you want and in fact you know, a lot of these advanced exploitation frameworks are things that say, okay, this is my binary, find all the gadgets. And so these will scan all your binary, find everything that ends with a rat or other jumps, other things that you can control, and you can say, okay, put all these addresses on the stack, and this is the computation that you will execute. And the computation is a shellcode, could be open a socket to uh, this particular location, download some, you know, some data, save it to a file, call system, whatever you want. But you can compose these ROP gadgets to, uh, to, have, uh, to uh, allow execution. Of course, you know, people decided, well, you know, let's make it even harder. You know, if we allow people to smash the stack and do return into libc, that's not good. So we have to, yes? Won't those gadgets, um, the ones that are available, won't that depend on what code the victim is executing? 
Absolutely. And in fact, if you have a lot of code, you have a lot of gadgets, sometimes you can find yourself that the, the executable is so small, you don't have the gadgets that you need. But and then you're out of luck. How would you know ahead of time what gadgets will be available? Because the executable is something that most of the time you have. If you're completely blind about the execution, so think about the, uh, your homework. You have to execute. You, you, you will not have to do you know, ROP exploitation. That's a little beyond the... Uh, but you, know, you have the binary. You have the code. Even if it's set to ID, it's a file that you can read. Okay? You cannot modify it, but you know where the code is, and you can see where the gadgets are. It's your binary code. It's on a specific binary because you will smash the stack of a certain program. The program has a certain code. That's the code that is at your disposal in order to find out the, uh, the available gadgets. So for the code links libc or OpenSSL, some big library, your chances of having gadgets is you know, important. But there has been a lot of research in combating Gadgets. I mean, people came up with all sorts of different things so that a, a library will never have gadgets that can be used in an attack. So this ROP exploitation has been, even for the research community, a very important um, sort of object of research. Another classic paper uh, that comes, came, you know, uh, almost 20 years ago is uh, StackGuard, which is uh, a technique that is uh, deceivingly simple. The basic idea is like, we want to prevent this stack smashing attack. How do we do it? Well, you know, we put between the stack, from the, we, we add another value so that if you overwrite the return address, you also have to overwrite this value. And before returning, and I say, is my value being messed with? And if that's the case, you seg fault. Okay? So fundamentally, imagine you can have different types of canary, canary, uh, canary uh, and the concept of canary is like you know you put in a coal mine, and if there is uh, some gas leak, the canary would die before you die. You know you know where that comes from, you know canary in a coal mine. So the canary here is the same concept. The canary will die before you can actually die by you know stack overflow. So you can have a terminator canary, like a zero uh, return, carriage return, line feed, end of file, so that if you have to overwrite using uh, a string copy, for example, you cannot have, for example, a null byte. And so you will not be able to overwrite the canary. Or you can use a random value. So you put a random value there, and then at exit, you check, is the random value still there? Because you don't know what the random value is. So if you overwrite it, you will overwrite with another random value. And it's, you know, it's a 32-bit value or even bigger. And so guessing it becomes really hard. Of course, this comes at a cost. Every time you exit, you're returning from a function, you have to check that that value is still uh, valid. And also, you can also use a random value XORed with the intended return address. So if you have something that is able, because you have a, you know, um, if you have a sort of arbitrary override and you're able to bypass the canary, okay, you can do also a check to say, hey, is the random value consistent with the return address that was there when we had to return, okay? And this, uh, of course, requires that you recompile everything because you have to add your return from a function call is not the normal return from function call anymore, but it's something that has to check for the canary before doing the ret. So, and you know, and so this introduces overhead. If you think about it, um, I see maybe we're on the late side, but <clears throat> I know this stuff is, but this is particularly, I like it because it's particularly simple. Uh, <clears throat> If you think about it, so this is your stack, right? And see, here you have, you know, your EBP, you have your EIP that has been saved, and here you put your canary, and this is your, your normal, you know, stack here. So you can see 
in most of the overflow, you go like this. And so, you know, before you can overwrite this or this, you have to overwrite this. So the, the terminator can, can, canary is something to say, if you're using string copy for this, okay, you will have to have zero, you have to reproduce the canary. So you have to put zero, zero, zero D, zero A, F, F. So in, the str in order to make sure that you override this stuff by you put here zero, zero, zero D, zero A, F, F, you have to have that in your string. But if you have a zero in your string, string copy will stop exactly here. So your, your string copy will not work. Of course, if you have a you know, random routine that reads character from the network and just smash them on the stack, you could actually, when, when you're overflowing, you get here, you actually send these three characters, okay? And you can overflow it. Of course, a lot of routines stop when you have a carriage return. They stop when they have an end of file. So that's the idea for that particular canary. Uh, a much better canary is just just put something that is random. 16, 12, 0, A, B, D. Now, how do you know that you have to put those four characters there? You don't. So there is a, at the end of the function, the function remembered that it put this value here, and now it will... Oh, it will find, you know, 18, 22, 45 AA because you overflow it and say, uh-uh, that's not the value that I put there originally. You're just messing with my stack. I'm going to die. Now, now, suppose that the guy was able to do a, a random, uh, an arbitrary overwrite, left this completely unchanged, but just overwrote these four bytes and is ready to jump to its code. Now I can do put here something that is original EIP XOR random value. So when I return, I say, okay, I save my random value. I XOR with the EIP that I set up when I enter the function. Oh, you're messing with my stack. I'm going to die. And then you cannot jump to anything. Is that clear? Questions? Awesome. <clears throat> yes. No, actually, uh, most applications use this. Okay. So yes. Uh, yes. So, like, like, compile something, Yes, absolutely. I think it's actually the default flag. Yes. Where is this range of values stored? Is that something that. In a parallel stack. You have to keep a data structure where you save these stacks. Yes. Deterministic builds. Yeah. Meaning that, I mean, so if that value is known because I have the binary, mm -hmm. so all the binaries in the world have the same random values. No, why the random values are generated at runtime? It comes from thread local storage where it gets put by the operator. Thread local storage where it gets put by the operator. The operating system generates this random. When you make the call to the function, okay. I generate a, no a random number at that time, and I put it here, okay. and I save it in the you know the per process information. Okay. So it doesn't matter. It's not it's not static in the file. Yeah. Yes. And so this sort of attack, or um, I guess this defense against this sort of attack, wouldn't really be needed if you had something like uh, Java or Rust or something. Right? Yeah, in Java you cannot smash the stack. Because uh, they're not fast enough, oftentimes. I, you know, sometimes uh, if you look at a lot of graphic processing, things that require almost real-time access, they want something that is A, fast, and B, predictable. Okay. There, are, there are various problems. I mean, Python is slower than C, right, right. but it's so much easier to write, and that doesn't have a lot of problems. So for certain things, Python is perfect. But if you want to do a uh, you know, graphic card driver, you're going to write in C and C++. You're not going to write it in Java. Are there any extensions that could be added to C++ to perform like bounds checking? There are extensions that would perform bound checking, but those add a lot of overhead. Okay. 
And also, you know, for things like Java, you have garbage collection. So you have something that, in a way that you cannot really control, decides, hey, I'm going to do some garbage collection now. I'm going to take a break and look at this memory, make sure, and maybe, you know, if you have some kind of real-time system, you cannot afford that. So, <clears throat> in Linux, you know, you can actually stat, with GCC, you can do stack pr protector using... Uh, um, uh, GCC options. Uh, also, there is uh, something that is, it was called Propolis that not only uh, does that, but also organizes the variables on the stack so that overflow are less likely to impact. For example, suppose that on the stack here, you have a function pointer and then a buffer. They say, oh, if you overflow this buffer, you could overwrite a function pointer. Even though you don't touch any of this, you will still be able to execute code. So I say, what if I take this function pointer and I put it here? Now your overflow will not touch that function pointer. And so by rearranging uh, variables in a certain way, you can prevent certain type, um, certain type of attack. And if the arguments cannot be arranged, then they can be copied to local variables. And so in this way, they cannot be um, manipulated. And there is you know, uh, a lot of paper. There is a lot of research that went from, I would say, 98, from the StatGuard paper, there have been point guard to protect pointers, and all sorts of checks on memory bounds, on C++ arrays, on anything to prevent these memory corruption um, attacks. There are seriously uh, hundreds and hundreds of um, papers. Of course, uh, that, you know, the canaries can be bypassed if you have an arbitrary override. For example, you have a string copy of a 4 byte. Um, so as, as, as we said, you could override the return address, and that why XORing it with the, um, with the return address is a useful tool. But of course, you, know, you can always overwrite pointers in the function frame. Um, you, of course, need to know exactly how the layout of the memory is, and of course, this has been also introduced in Windows, and the slash, slash GS option does exactly this. So now that we have this thing, we have still you know, uh, other problems. For example, we saw returning to libc. We could have an override pointer that allows us to jump to somewhere in libc that execute a system. There's still problems from that point. So people say, hey, let's make guessing addresses on the, in the process really hard. So you don't know where stuff is. This is address space layout randomization. And this fundamentally randomizes almost everything on the stack. On the, sorry, in the process uh, image. The heap, the stack, the code, and even the dynamically linked libraries like libc. Now your gadgets are very difficult to find because your libc changes continuously every time you invoke a process. Everything is randomized. And while, you know, in 32-bit architectures, the situation in which you can actually brute force this, and it has been, you know, there are papers that describe attacks and optimize attacks to actually get the right. So if you can execute something, like in your case, you can, you know, you have a set to ID program on a machine, you can invoke that program a million times, right? Until you get it right. Of course, remotely is a little harder because uh, it, it, there is delay and everything else. But you know, of course, in 64-bit architecture, the space is so enormous that your chances of getting it right is negligible. It just won't happen. Okay, and <clears throat> so this makes a return into libc um, uh, much harder at a very, uh, very uh, small overhead. Well, there is first of all the requirement that libraries are, are position independent. So they have to, they have to this, this pick position independent code. Um, and you know you have to remap stuff uh, during uh, runtime. And if you look at SLR in Linux, uh, this is, LM, is enabled by default. You can look at this particular variable in the proc file system. If it's set to one, that means you have SLR. So you can also, as root, set it to zero so that your stack will not be, uh, or your SLR will not be randomized. And that's especially useful when you're testing 
and you're trying to do an exploit and learn about exploitation, having a known SLR uh, stack is extremely useful. And so this is implemented partly by the kernel, and of course the loader has to know that as to um, uh, randomize it. So there is a stack layout randomization, libs and memory maps, um, execution, so libraries and things like that. And also, when you ask for, for mem additional memory on uh, using a break, you can have um, randomization there. So what do you do if you're an exploit under SLR? Well, fundamentally, you need to have two exploits. You need one exploit that is a leak that tells you where the stack or the libraries are. Okay? And you need one exploit to actually perform the attack based on the information you just received. So that's where, for example, printf attacks are great because if you do, you know, print a bunch of pointers and they tell you what's on the stack, one of them is the address. Oh, I know that that's the address of, you know, variable three that is an offset 1000 from the beginning of the stack. Now I get the, res the, the, the value of that address. I compute the difference. I know where the stack is. Awesome. Okay. And you can do the same thing if you have a pointer to a library. You can identify that pointer, and now you know where your code is. Uh, of course, we, we saw that it can be defeated by brute forcing, but mostly we do um, two-step attack where you have a leak and an exploitation. And if you look how exploitation is done nowadays in professional environment, you know they have like seven exploits, one after another. The first exploit is a Java confusion attack that allows you to execute uh, arbitrary code. And then you have another exploit that allows you to get out of the sandbox of the, the browser. And then there is another exploit that allows you to run code as root. And as this, you can do something with the kernel that allows you to load a driver that has another exploit and so forth. So it's not as, oh, buffer overflow. That very seldom, you know happens. And to finish, the, let, let me finish, there is another uh, idea that is becoming more and more popular than this control flow integrity. So fundamentally, this wants to defeat those ROP attacks. Because with, with ROP, you're jumping in places in the code where you're never supposed to jump. You're never supposed to jump in the middle of a function to do you know, an epilogue. So somebody said, hey, what if we actually look at the control flow graph of the whole binary and we remember all the places where we can jump? Most of the time we can figure out a vast number of situations in which we know exactly that you can only jump at the beginning of a function, not in the middle of a function. And you cannot return to, you know, the beginning of a function. You will return after a call. So you can do all these checks of how the flow should actually happen, the execution flow, and put checks. So when you do a rat, it's like, am I returning after one of these three calls that could have called this function? Because if I'm returning into the middle of a function, I can seg fault and suicide right there. And you will not be able to do that. So. Uh, this is exactly the idea behind CFI. Of course, this makes exploitation a lot harder. Uh, depending on the type of CFI that you have, you still have ways to execute code. And there are paper on defeating CFI, and that people come with better check of CFI, but they brought a lot of overhead. So there is always a trade-off between the overhead being introduced by this technique and the ability to actually uh, protect the execution flow of a program. So this concludes our application security, so that's why I give me two minutes more than normal. Uh, remember, uh, application are broken by providing unexpected input from the network, from the environment, from the parameters, it doesn't matter. Uh, and understanding how data flows into your application and how to sanitize to prevent people from doing uh, bad things to your stack or your heap is very important. Uh, using good coding practices, safe languages if you can, can really reduce the ability 
of people to exploit your, your code. And of course, you know, even though we have been talking a lot about memory corruption, buffer overflow, heap overflow, there is still a lot to say about application logic attacks. So things that, you know, it's very difficult to model because they are actually problems in the logic of your application, not just on the stack on the heap. And with this, I want to finish. This is how, this is the GCC command line that today you have to put in in order to have an easily exploitable uh, binary. Okay? If you compile normally, you know, if you have to say, okay, don't omit the freight pointer, you know, don't use position independent code, make sure that the stack boundary is two, otherwise, you, for example, you cannot off by one vulnerabilities on the EBP. Don't, you know, put a bunch of fortify uh, stuff, um, no PIE, no format string vulnerability checking, no format string vulnerability security add-ons, do not put a stack protector, uh, rel row is another thing for, you know, relocating issue that allows you to, you know, make, make the stack executable. So you have to bag the, oh, the, the, the the, the compiler to make this poor test thing actually compile. And this is how we compile the, um, the programs that you will have to exploit. So, you know, otherwise it would be a, a lot harder. Instead, we're going to give you the most prone to attack surface you can work on. Please have fun with it. If you cannot log in of a problem, always send email to on the mailing list. Fish is amazingly in working on this from China and is incredibly responsive, but you know, fish is fish. Thank you, and I'll see you Monday.